For everyone, uh, we're about to start today's actual webinar, which showcases the work carried out on a recent ECSE project. Uh, so this afternoon, we have three speakers. We have Anton uh, Sternlich from the uh, University of Bristol. We have uh, Louis Tavamenos uh, from EPCC and Lee Maggots from the University of Magin uh, Manchester. Uh, so the webinar is entitled Open Source Exascale Multiscale Framework for the UK Solid Mechanics Community. And I understand that Anton is going to start us off. So I'll hand over to Anton right now. OK, thank you, Chris. So my name is Anton Sternlicht. I'm from the University of Bristol, as Chris said. And this talk is based on the recently completed ECSC, or Embedded Science and Engineering Project, Open Source Exascale Multiscale Framework for the UK Solid Mechanics Community. I'll start by uh, explaining why solid mechanics community needs a multi-scale capability. I'll give a brief introduction to cellular automata method and why it is attractive to multiple solid mechanics problems and beyond. I'll then describe why we have chosen Fortran core arrays to implement a particular cellular automata method. Then Lee will describe the key distinguishing features of Parafem, an open source finite elements analysis library. A key part of this talk is the CAFE, or Cell Automata Finite Element Framework, where I'll describe how we linked MPI, which is uh, implementation of the Parafilm with Fortran Core Arrays, to create a hybrid MPI Core Array code. Louis will then give the details of our CRAPAD profiling and tracing work on Archer and the resulting optimizations. I'll then conclude with a brief description of our TAU profiling work on non-CRAY Linux platforms, TAU stands for Tune and Analysis Utilities, and this is a very portable tool developed by the University of Oregon, Portland. After that, I'll briefly talk about unresolved issues left for the future. So why multi-scale modeling of fracture? Because all real materials are heterogeneous. So some popular engineering and medical examples are shown here, including bone, reinforced concrete, carbon fiber, reinforced polymer, graphite, including nuclear graphite, metal matrix composites, and uh, polycrystalline materials, such as steels or aluminum alloys. Fracture, or structural integrity of components with defects, is one of the key engineering problems. Fracture behavior is the result of complex interactions of multiple competing physical processes taking place at different time and length scales. So a multi-scale modeling framework is required to capture this complexity. Here I'm showing the summary of uh, the multi-scale framework, framework on, one, on one slide. We use cellular automata, which is a structured grid method, to simulate evolving material microstructure at the fine scale. And we use finite elements, which is an unstructured grid method to solve the continuum mechanics problems at the coarse scale and calculate the stress and strain fields and perhaps temperature and strain rate and so on. And there is a two-way information exchange between CA and the FE. From FE to CA, we call it localization, where stress, strain fields and so on, continuum fields are redistributed over CA cells. And from CA to FE, we call it homogenization. We pass back uh, typically damage variables. In some literature, uh, you can hear words like gathering and scattering instead of localization, homogenization. Fracture on the fine scale is encapsulated in a set of scalar damage variables. And um, below, you see a range of CAFE simulations on the CA scale, on the cell automata scale, showing polycrystal grains and grain boundaries and cracks propagating through the grain boundaries and uh, across grains and merging micro cracks into a uh, emerging macro crack. A few words on cell automata now. So CA is a discrete space, discrete time method, which could be used in one, two, three, or n spatial dimensions and on finite or infinite spaces. CA is a local method. This is very important. The state of any cell at the next iteration is determined by the state of some neighborhood 
at the current iteration. What you see here are two popular neighborhood types, one Neumann's and Moore's. Theory of Self-Reproducing Automata was the title of John von Neumann's 1966 book, and his name is very strongly associated with CA. So the title points to the early interest in CA, which has since become a much more generally useful method. As an example here, we show a very simple probabilistic CA for solidification. With uh, image on the left is iteration i, image on the right is states at the end of iteration i plus one. Numbers, non-zero numbers denote unique orientation, crystallographic orientations of single crystals and zero denotes, denotes liquid phase. A single crystal is simply a blob of connected CA cells of some kind or number. Each iteration, liquid cells copy the state of a randomly chosen neighbor to themselves. As you can see, a lot of this operation is uh, redundant, but the logic is extremely simple and it's explicitly parallel algorithm. The loop, the iterative loop is shown here, which is a very simple algorithm. Importantly, we exploit this degree of uh, parallelism in this algorithm for fracture simulations as well. Just some examples of single grains and microstructures, including realistic equiax and uh, here columnar grains, single grains here, more regular and arbitrary shaped blobs. And uh, this just shows the power of this very, very primitive solidification algorithm, which doesn't even take into account a lot of complicated uh, solidification physics. But the resulting microstructures are very similar to those obtained with much more complicated methods. When continuum fields are superimposed over CA, typically from FE simulations, then a CAFE model is created, cell automata finite elements. Here you see some examples from our prior work and work of others, including fracture of oxide scale here at the top, dendritic grain growth in which temperature field is used here at bottom left. And you can see here two-way information exchange, temperature and um, recrystallization here. Uh, study of the ductal to brittle transitional fracture is shown here in the Sharpe impact test. Although the focus of the use of CA in this project is uh, fracture and microstructure evolution, CA is used today to solve a wide, wide variety of problems in engineering, science, medicine, and environment. For example, here you see applications in uh, fire control, spread of epidemics, as well as land use, diffusion, magnetization, and sun pile formation. It has really become a very, very generic, generally useful method for science and engineering applications. Let's now look at Fortran core arrays and why their natural implementation choice for CA, for cellular automata. Core arrays have been around for over 20 years probably, primarily on Cray systems as an extension to the Fortran standard. They have been standardized in Fortran 2008 with a much richer functionality coming with Fortune 2015, which, by the way, is going to be voted by the national standards committees probably in April this year, and then the, finally, the final approval should come at the June meeting of WG5, the um, ISO Fortune Committee. Most of 20OA standards are supported by Cray, Intel, and recently, uh, open car race project, which provides a transport library and uses GCC as the front end. So GCC supports the syntax and open car race is a BSD licensed, licensed transport layer implementing core communications. Core race have been designed to be a minimal syntax extension to the Fortune 90 that would allow remote communications. Variables declared with square brackets, like here, are core array variable, core array variables. At runtime, a certain number of identical copies of the executable are launched. These are called images. 
Core A syntax provides single-sided remote read and write calls between images. No cooperation from the remote side is needed, and for this reason, modern Fortran can be called a PGAS language. That is uh, partition global address space. Core A specification also defines execution control and in 2015 standard collectives, teams, uh, events, atomics, and facilities for dealing with failed images. We have written a CA library called CGPAC. There it is, there's a link to SourceForge page for the library, with heavy use of core arrays. At the heart is this space core array. This is an allocatable core array with four dimensions and three core dimensions. A large model can be constructed by analyzing space core arrays from all images together, which is illustrated here in the bottom images. What you see here are chunks of the model space stored on different images. On the left is the model run on 18 images with a 2 by 3, 2 by 3 by 3 core array grid. On the right is the model run on 64 images with a 4 by 4 by 4 core array grid. And the color here simply shows the image number. So what you see here are 64 distinct cubes, distinct chunks of the large model. Jumping ahead to performance, uh, I wanted to put this early on. Unfortunately, the standard defines no parallel I.O. to match core arrays. In the early draft, there was a proposal, but uh, it proved to be much too content contentious issue. So there is absolutely nothing in the Fortran standard. So no, no native parallel I.O. in the standard. In our work, we have successfully used MPI.O. directly and NetCDF and HDF5 parallel writers. However, at this stage, the NetCDF and HDF5 rates lag behind raw MPIO, which can reach uh, up to, I've got a figure here, 14 gigabytes per second. Uh, and we can get only about 10% of that with NetCDF. Uh, not clear why, and Cray engineers have been informed, and I think they are still investigating the issue. So this is one area that needs further investigation, as the model data sets can be quite large. What you see here is a one terabyte data set, a uh, complete microstructure, about one terabyte. Some CGBug problems, we can also call them mini apps, which really encapsulates the purpose of those programs. They just test various library routines in a particular sequence. For example, solidification shown here can scale at least up to 32,000 cores. And here's the plot where I've studied several collective algorithms. Cray implementation, Cray's implementation, of course, some, the orange squares, uh, delivers the most reliable scaling, as you can see here. I'll now pass over to Lee to describe Parafem and I'll mute my microphone. Okay, Anton, thank you very much. Can can you hear me at least? Can anybody, hear? oh, you've muted yeah. your microphone, so. Yes, I can see, I can, I can hear you. I can hear, I've just unmuted for a second here. Yeah. Okay, that was a bit of a silly question to lots of people with muted microphones. Um, the, before I start talking about Parafem, I, I, I'd just like to thank um, EPCC and the Archer Service for for going to the effort of setting up this type of uh, webinar facility and posting the um, the the recorded sessions online on on YouTube. I think it's a really excellent idea and uh, a very valuable resource that's built up. So uh, you know, I really recommend everybody here to have a look through the library of various different um, recordings. And I hope that Archer have some influence on the new tier two HPC centers and perhaps the research software engineering community and PRACE to do a similar thing because I think that there's a, there would be an amazing amount of uh, material available uh, for all of us to have a look at. So let me um, introduce you to Parafem. So I'm 
I'm the uh, director of the Parafem open source software project. And Parafem is a scalable um, library for, for finite element analysis. And it's associated with a Wiley uh, textbook called Programming the Finite Element Method. Now, this textbook has um, 12 chapters. And the first three chapters are about the basics of programming finite elements. Chapters 4 to 11 cover lots of different types of um, engineering algorithms from elasticity, uh, nonlinear um, deformation or plasticity, uh, flow uh, problems, um, uh, dynamic problems, uh, and various different types of problems that the finite element can be used, method can be used to solve. And the chapter 12 is um, a chapter that describes how to convert all of the uh, different algorithms that are discussed in the rest of the book into programs that can be run on supercomputers like Archer. And this book um, provides all of the source code um, for around about 70 what what we called used to call um, driver programs so they're like two to four page long um, Fortran programs that all use the same common library and now we're you know because in the HBC community people talk about mini apps we've we've changed a little bit our um, sort of description of those to call them mini apps now this is this is a book that's in its fifth edition, and um, I think it's worth pointing out that the software goes back to the 1960s and has and has continually been updated. So the first author there, Ian Smith, was um, a postdoc at Berkeley in the 1960s, working with Ray Clough, the person that first coined the term. Uh, finite elements. And Vaughan Griffiths, who's the second author, was Ian's first uh, PhD student. And myself, Lee Margetts there, I'm Ian's last PhD student. And I often joke that all the other PhD students that Ian had in his career actually wrote all the programs that are in that book. So the parallel um, parts of the, the software, um, the parallel, parallel algorithms use uh, MPI and iterative um, solvers of various flavors. And for very large problems, say around a billion degrees of freedom, we've shown examples of scaling of different types of problems on up to 64,000 cores. So it's a very um, scalable code and it's provided with uh, an open license that allows anybody to download uh, the code, modify it and, and even repackage it and sell it. So I'm not sure if I'm permitted to click to the next slide. Yes, I am. Okay, so the then this slide gives kind of a picture of my sort of uh, vision for Parafem as a component in, um, in what Anton has described as a multi-scale um, framework for, for engineering simulation. So, so this slide is Parafem centric with Parafem the biggest part in the center there. But what we've been doing over the past couple of years is building collaborations with various groups so that um, my interest is in parallel finite elements so I focus on that and and I you know I work with um, various technologies like MPI and OpenMP and play about with the finite elements on Xeon Phi and, and GPUs and so I focus on that and there are various projects 
that have happened and that there are in progress that interface Parafem with other um, software, open source software packages. So on the on the top right hand side there, you can see we've got the cellular automata. So this is the collaboration with Anton of Bristol. Um, I've also, um, you know, there's also a collaboration with uh, the group that developed OpenFoam, and we've got a project that's funded by General Electric to um, integrate or to couple Parafem and OpenFoam for fluid structure interaction. Um, we have collaborations with uh, groups in the US looking at stochastic finite elements. Our package that we, we adopt for, to do uh, visualization is Paraview. So, you know, so we're, the vision is that Parafem would be one of one possible um, parallel finite element component in a larger um, multi scale framework for um, engineering simulation. So I'll give give a couple of examples of um, uses or where where Parafem is being used at the moment. So one of one of the groups that uses Parafem is at Cullen Center for Fusion Energy, and they've been using it to look at uh, thermomechanical problems, um, analyzing the um, or characterizing the materials used in the uh, the wall of um, the fusion reactor, the ITER fusion reactor, and seeing whether it can, or selecting different materials to build that wall that faces the plasma and acts as, and provides a heat transfer um, mechanism to take heat from the plasma and uh, heat up ironically, and I find this very funny, um, water that then turns to steam and then drives steam turbines to create electricity. And I find that a little bit ironic that we're coupling a very, very complicated, the idea is to couple a very complicated machine um, with technology that was developed uh, 150, 200 years ago. So it's just like a very big expensive uh, kettle. So um, on the what they what they've been used, why they've needed to use very large um, scale uh, or very large core counts and uh, solve very large models if, is that they've been looking at materials at the micro scale. Um, so the the small picture on the top right hand side is the top surface of a finite element mesh of a composite. It's, it's not um, the hills in the Lake District. And so we've been able to look at defects in the manufacture of various ma materials and evaluate whether um, you know, those are important or contribute to whether the, the, the uh, the plasma facing wall can do its job. So for that that type of simulation, um, this this curve shows some of the scaling characteristics of Parafem for a transient thermal analysis. So we have on the left hand side of this graph the time in seconds, and along the bottom axis the number of cores. And so a problem that runs um, in around about an hour, two hours on 16 cores um, can be reduced to around about 10 seconds on, I think about 16,000 cores on Archer. So this, this particular example, we're, we're actually only profiling one step in, in the analysis. And the full simulation would take around about 20, 20 minutes on 16,000 cores. And if we were to use um, a standard commercial finite element package, we wouldn't be able to solve this problem at all. 
And if you could, we've estimated that the, the um, problem would take around about two years to solve. So that's, you know, a, a huge benefit um, in, in two different ways. So in this, this last slide about Parafem, before I hand, hand back to um, Anton, gives, uh, gives you an idea of some of the application areas uh, where Parafem is used. So the, the, the top left-hand corner is one of these components from the ITER uh, reactor. So this is work that's been carried out by Dr. Keon Evans at the Carbon Center for Fusion en Energy. And another researcher that's using Parafem for uh, power generation research is uh, Dr. David Reggie at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the US. Um, the code has been used also um, by uh, paleontologists. So there's Bill Sellers at the University of Manchester and uh, Professor Phil Manning at the College of Charleston in the USA. And to be honest, I found it much easier to persuade paleontologists to use high performance computers to do finite element simulations than I have done engineers because they haven't come across Abacus. So I don't need to wean them off um, that, that package. Uh, two other areas are, um, one is micromechanics and the characterization of materials. So this is work that um, is carried out together or in collaboration with the um, large group run by Professor Philip Withers, the University of Manchester, who, who's the director of the, the Roy Center for Materials. And it, the software has also been used in um, biomechanics, and so the, uh, at the same time as this BCSC um, project, there's been another one that's been run um, by the University of Edinburgh uh, that's led by uh, Dr. Pankaj Pankaj, and uh, his one of his colleagues, Dr. Fran Fran Francesc Lero, uh, have been adapting Parafem to uh, carry out um, very sort of complex microstructural analyses of bone that have included uh, geometric nonlinearity and uh, and permanent plastic deformation. And so, in in each of these domain areas, the philosophy that I have is that um, my my group at Manchester. Um, help adapt the code for these specific domain areas and and then that new code goes into the open source software um, release uh, for the benefit of, of, of other groups. And so, you know, in the same way as the collaboration with Anton down at Bristol. And in fact, looking in the future, each of these areas, what we hope is that they will benefit also from the coupling of the cellular automata uh, multi-scale modeling framework. So at that point, I'll um, hand back over to Anton. OK, thank you, Lee. Please uh, stay around in case there are some questions on Parafilm at the end. OK. So I'll now describe how we have built the ca 2 fp mapping, which is really the CAFE model. As I mentioned before, the key fact affecting the CAFE design is that CA is a structured grid, while FE is an unstructured grid. So consider CA space as a shoebox positioned and oriented randomly within an FE model. Let me see if I can use a pointer. So this is a CA shoebox positioned and oriented randomly within an FE model, um, which can potentially be a very complex geometry. So this is a schematic of the CAFE model. 
this shoebox of the microstructure positioned somehow within a irregular unstructured Fe grid. A major assumption is that there is always an identical, identical number of core images and MPI processes, so that each processing element or PE will have a chunk of the CA microstructure and the chunk of the FE mesh. So um, what you see here is an example with four processing elements. The shoebox is split into four parts, four images, and the FE mesh is split somehow into four MPI chunks. Um, however, the information exchange between FE and CA is not based on where these chunks are stored, but only on whether the microstructure and the mesh occupy the same physical space. So in this illustration, uh, you see the arrows which show communications between CA and FE. Arrows crossing the boxes. So the boxes denote processing elements, PEs, and say this P3 processing elements 3 will store uh, a chunk of MPI, a chunk of FE mesh, and a chunk of CA model image 3, MPI rank 3. But I see when they start at, at 1. Arrows crossing the boxes indicate remote communications. Okay, and arrows which are wholly contained within the boxes are local communications, such as this arrow here or this arrow there. So, for example, note that the chunk of the FE mesh stored on processing element one, which is denoted by MPI one, does not communicate at all with the CA chunk stored on image one, because these do not share physical space. Image one is here and MPI-1 is there. They do not share the same physical space. Instead, this chunk of the FE model will have to communicate with the CA chunk stored in images 2 and 4 because, uh, where is it? Uh, there he is. Because image 2 and image 4 contain chunks of the CA microstructure which share the same physical space as the a part of the FE mesh stored on PE1. This slide really is the very heart of the multi-scale CA FE framework. This is how we've done the communication between the two parts of the multi-scale model. The mapping is established via a private allocatable array of derived type, L center, and um, this is not a core array, but it's calculated using the mapping data in core array centroid TMP. So this is a core array because you can see here square brackets is a scalar core array of derived type RCA with an allocatable real array component. The key role of this array L center is shown here. Again, it's a very schematic diagram. The vertical bar here separates two processing elements, P on the left and processing element Q on the right. So this is also MPI process P and image P, and this is also MPI process Q and image Q. Um, so both processing elements store a chunk of a fee model, shown schematically here, vertical bar, and a chunk of CA space, these small cubes here. And the mapping is established again based on sharing common physical space. For example, material point with coordinates R, some schematic designation of coordinates, is stored in image P. And the array L center on this image shows that it maps R maps onto finite element with number N stored in image Q. This is finite element N stored in image Q. And this correspondence is shown with the solid double-ended arrow. Then, for example, a material point with coordinates T, this one, is stored in image Q, but it communicates with finite element number A, whatever it is, stored in image P. So this is that double-ended arrow. Both images P and Q will maintain this structure for the duration of the analysis, and this way we can always know which chunks of the CA uh, we'll have to communicate with the, which parts of the FE. 
The dashed arrows here show again local communications, which are much faster, obviously, than remote solid arrows. A range of fracture models can be constructed based on the described CAFE framework. In this work, we consider an isotropic linear elastic solid and cleavage fracture, which is a fully brittle transgranular fracture in polycrystals. The details are shown here. I'm not sure many people are interested in the metallography, so I wouldn't go into too much details here. Just to say that the FE stress tensor is passed to CA and resolved to uh, uh, normal stresses on 1O and 1O crystal planes, which is shown here. And after certain increments of a cleavage fracture propagation done with uh, CA cells, uh, the damage is encoded into a single scalar damage, var damage variable D in this, in this model, which is used to reduce material stiffness. So D equals 1, initially meaning no damage, progressively D is decreasing to 0, which means integration point has failed, has no load-bearing capacity. The Young's modulus drops to 0, although in practice we don't decrease it to 0 exactly, but uh, just very small value to avoid numerical singularity in in the matrix inversion. What you see here is a selection of simulated fracture predictions. The top row shows the CAFE model of a cylindrical bar, 3D model, of course, cylindrical bar under tension. What you see here is the microstructure superimposed over a semi-transparent FE mesh. This is the microstructure that is the uh, Grain boundaries only shown here, not the grain interiors. And what you see here is that cracks in single grains, either on 1O, which is yellow, or 1O, which is uh, highlighted in blue, crystal planes are merging to form a mic macro crack, the effect of which is strain localization on the FE scale. So what you see here is a contraplot of displacements, and this high gradient here indicates the crack on the FE scale, not on the CA scale. I think now I'll try to show a few animations. Uh, let me see if I can do it. Maybe I need to stop this first. Oh, there it is. So what you see here is the 3D view of the microstructure. In this case, with just 100 grains. Again, colors denote uh, uniquely, uniquely define a uh, particular crystal orientation. But it's hard to say from the color exactly what that orientation is. There will be a lookup table somewhere in the in the model relating the grain number to its crystallographic orientation. Uh, this is, where is it? Grain boundaries, which is an um, interesting visualization because this is something you can really not observe in the experiments. We use binary thresholding usually when we um, use the usual grinding, polishing, etching, but still this sort of 3D visualization of grain boundaries is not directly obtainable in the experiments, which provides an extra usefulness for this type of model. And I'll show maybe just one uh, illustration, progressive propagation of brittle fracture. The seemingly chaotic uh, process is shown here. Yet, if you look at it at a different angle, you will see that there is a preferential plane, preferential macro plane. Even though individual cracks are emerging on the different crystallographic planes, they gradually merge into a um, more or less well-defined macro plane. OK, let me get back to the presentation.
Okay, now I'll pass on to Luis, who was our key person undertaking profiling tracing and optimization with Craypart on Archer, and uh, he will give you a few details of that work. I'll mute my microphone. Okay, um, if you just give Luis uh, just one minute, he'll be with you. So while, while he's, he's getting ready, I'll say a few words about the bottom row of images here. What you see here is a patch test, which is a very popular test in solid mechanics for validation purposes and for correctness in, in the FE, correctness checking in the FE. Uh, so it's a 3D model, but two planes of symmetry, so only quarter of it is, quarter of the geometry is modeled here. What you see here is a realization on the FE scale, which again is a displace, displacement map, and you don't really see much apart from slight break in the blue band here, which is a, again, manifestation of a crack on the macro scale. But interestingly, what you see here is the stochastic nature of the model. We ran this patch test twice, and we got two distinct fracture simulations. Again, blue and green denote cracks from different crystallographic planes, which in both cases merge into a macro crack. But this is this highlights the ability of this multi-scale framework to produce statistically meaningful simulations. If we run it, um, say, five, ten times, statistics can be collected for statistical comparison with uh, the experiments, not just one for one, but in a statistical sense, which is something that the engineers in solid mechanics only now um, trying to embrace. We, I think we are catching up with the developments in statistical science. Okay, I think Luis is there, so I'll mute my microphone now. Hello? Yeah. yeah, okay. Oh, uh, hi. Sorry about that. I have to reboot my computer. Um, thank you, Anton. So, so what, I'll explain my part, which I've been doing. I've been working on the profiling uh, of the different mini apps that we built on, on Archer. Um, so, um, Initial profiling. So the profiling of the application was um, carried out on Arch, and we mainly use uh, the CreatePad tool. Um, it, we we started off by analyzing our code um, within a scalability study, um, and we found out that although both libraries is quite uh, scale quite well on their own, the combination of both made the scalability uh, poor after 2,000 cores. So. Um, for this reason, we started uh, profiling analysis and running on seven seven thousand two hundred cores, and so we could understand what was happening at that scale. And this is what is uh, shown in this slide. Uh, we soon realized that uh, there was a function uh, which is called uh, CGCA GKPDA was actually taking almost forty percent of the time. So obviously, this this was the the first routine. Uh, uh, to look at for further optimization. Um, similarly, this is the uh, the raw data from the profiler, which we can see uh, uh, at the top of the of the user calls is this function. So um, this GKPDA GK subroutine, <laughs> what it does is implements an all-to-all -all communication pattern. So what this does is uh, it's a remote read from every single core array image, which is available on the on the system. Each core array image generates a random value, which will be used as the starting reading, and remotely read from there. This is obviously an expensive operation since the data has to be moved from, from every single image that is run in the simulation. So one of the what, what we thought that could be uh, solve this problem uh, was the implementation of of the nearest neighbor algorithm. Um, in in this algorithm, 
So only um, only the, the a core array image reads from the data from the immediate neighbors. Uh, this routine was called GKPDN, and um, the only thing is to make sure that the physics uh, work red. We have and, and, and the changes propagate um, from every image. We need to call this subroutine several times. So this is uh, the new profiling. Uh, the new profiling data once one, implementing this uh, the, this new subroutine. And uh, what well, we soon realized that the the the, the function that it was actually stopping the uh, the application uh, for further escalation, further, uh, it wasn't really an, uh, showing anymore in the in the profiling output. So the the profiling distribution shows some of the previous subroutines, but not not the not the new one. This also can be seen in the in the profiling in the raw raw data. Um, and the reason for this is because the, the new function is now below the profiler's threshold. So at this point, uh, we, uh, we carried out a new performance study, which, uh, which, which is the one that it shows here. Um, the, this, this graph shows the performance difference between both, so, so both implementations of the same, of the same, uh, same routine. So one is the uh, the old to all, which is the the red line, and the other one is the uh, the green line. It represents for the for the nearest neighbor algorithm. So there's om there's almost no difference up to 1,000 cores, uh, where we can then start to see the difference, and the the red line um, stops um, escalating, uh, where the green line continues up to around 7,000 cores. See the blue lines, actually, this is what it shows, is, is, the, is the, um, the scaling of, of the, the new, the new uh, mini-app implementing this uh, nearest neighbor algorithm. And this is, um, this is just an indication of what the load imbalance looks like at this scale. Um, we see that there is some acceptable difference in, in the in the course activity. So although uh, CrayPad supports Fortran core arrays for and profiling, and of course MPI, we encountered a, a couple of profiling issues. Uh, these issues were reported to to Cray for further investigation. Um, one of these issues was the inconsistency found in the analysis reports between the profiling and the, the sampling. Um, so, for instance, in this example, we can see that there is uh, the GQPDA subroutine at the top of the sampling. Um, however, this is not present in the, in the tracing analysis, and it should at least appear uh, with some percentage uh, since it's the most expensive subroutine. It is also called exactly the same number of times uh, as, as the other um, subroutine presenter, HXI, and which also appears in the tracing report. Um, the other issue that we found if, was related to the number of threads. So we can see uh, there the, the, uh, the, the profiling information says that there are three threads per PE. However, this is not uh, a multi-threaded application, and it should it should only show only one only one thread. Um, this would really wasn't a big problem at the moment, but it could cause some some uh, headaches once we uh, introduce more than one thread. So, continue with the optimization. Uh, we also found another all-to-all -all subroutine in the code, and this this. This one um, is, is called a PFEM send and appears to be the second most expensive routine. This routine establishes the, the L center array that Anton mentioned before. And uh, basically, if the centroid of, the, of an FE on image is within the core array of this image, then this FE is added to the L center array of this image. Uh, with this, we implemented a new routine that makes uh, makes use of the large temporary arrays 
and co-array collectives, COSAM and COMAX. And um, in, in this case, and the, this approach may prove problematic in the, the very, uh, very high core counts due to the memory limitations. So the, the new routine, this uh, PFM map, um, uses a large temporary array of length of the maximum number of FEEs on, on any image uh, times the number of, of images. Um, then all variables have to be recast in the same real kind before they are right into to the temporary array. The reason for this is that uh, these cosine and comax collectives work only with numeric, numeric types. So uh, again, we we profile these new uh, new routines, and um, perhaps even even better in, on the raw profiling, we can see the uh, the the uh, the PFM sense routine that used to employ more than five percent of the applications time. With this new one implemented now, it's just over one percent of uh, of it. This is um, it's all exactly. 1.2% uh, of the time. So um, we generate the new performance analysis with these new uh, new routines, and well, although although as we can see, the, there's no much improvement, um, especially um, up up to uh, 1,000 cores. Uh, we can see a slight perform performance improvement. Um, um, beyond 1,000 cores. The reason for this small in performance improvement is because these uh, these particular routines are only called once uh, in the whole simulation. So hence the 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 small in improvement on the performance. Um, and I'm hand it back to Anton now. Okay. So thank you, Luis. Uh, just to say that this, of course, wasn't the only work done uh, by Luis and not the only work done on profile optimization and, and tracing. Uh, in particular, the NetCDF and HDF5 results I showed earlier on were, uh, were done as well, and some optimizations were done there as well, and various other bits of the multi-scale framework. Uh, we're now approaching the, the final stages of this talk. So I'm going to talk about tile profiling briefly and then about the unresolved issues and uh, future work. Uh, this go back to the, goes back to the objectives of this uh, ECSC embedded science and engineering proposal. One objective was to improve portability of our CAFE framework. This, of course, is very important because core arrays is still not very widely adopted technology, and hybrid core array MPI, again, is even um, less widely used. To, to the best of my knowledge, there really are only two or three applications, and none of those are in engineering. There are weather applications, ECMWF, uh, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, who tried to, to use both MPI and core race. I think they actually tried to use OpenMP as well with mixed results. And there are some other bits of code with heavy help from Cray, but that's it. So portability was a very important objective for us. And with that in mind, we have ported the framework to Linux systems with the Intel or GCC open core race compilers. However, at present, there are very few open source profiling tools which support core arrays on these platforms. Of those available, we have chosen Tau, or Turing and Analysis Utilities, a toolkit developed by the University of Oregon at Portland. We did this because of its very high portability and rich feature set. We worked closely with Tau developers to extend its support for core arrays initially on Intel systems where core arrays are mapped onto MPI calls. In fact, as you can see here, Intel's implementation uses RMA, remote memory access, one-sided calls, which in principle should be an ideal match. Uh, core arrays could be thought of a single-sided communication approach and RMA the same. But as seen in this profiling plot, Intel version 16 implementation does not perform well. 
Uh, in this case, we use two 16 core nodes, 32 images in total. And you can see that the runtime is heavily dominated by RMA MPI win unlock call here. MPI barrier is the close second. And only four user routines count for more than 1% of runtime. Now, Intel have been very honest and clear about this, that their focus so far has been on standard compliance and not on performance. And they say that um, in version 17, performance have, has improved substantially, but we haven't been able to verify this yet because obviously new version and new bugs and new problems. So a few words on unresolved issues and for the work. Since CGPAC is a library, which can be used in diverse ways, the question of synchronization or image control cannot be easily solved. So this fragment shows a typical structure of a program written using CGPAC routines. In most cases, a global barrier, which is a sync call here, is the only uh, foolproof option. Some routines, like those show, shown at the top, are guaranteed not to work, guaranteed not to work, uh, meaning violating the standards, deadlocks, and races, and so on, without a global barrier. So it is included in the routines themselves. The user does not need to interfere. In other cases, the synchronization decision is left to the, to the user, and the barriers are inserted in the program between CGPAC calls, such as, for example, here. Uh, the synchronization requirements depend partly on the order of the calls to CGPAC routines. But without a deep knowledge of what these routines do and the inner structures, the user is left with no alternative really than to use a global barrier again. So you can see sync call used here in this, in this case after virtually every routine. All this might lead to over-synchronization of course, which could limit scaling at high core counts and all the usual problems. However, our profiling results so far did not point to this as a substantial bottleneck. So um, the conclusion really is that more analysis is necessary. We are thinking about designing a separate synchronization layer for CGPAC that would track changes to all core data on all images and automatically invoke minimum required image control to ensure data integrity, but this is really on the, at the design stage for now. One solution to more flexible synchronization is Fortran 2015 events, more flexible than sync images, which in turn is more flexible than sync call. Sync call is a global barrier and sync images is a synchronization between a selected group of images. So what you see here is a halo exchange algorithm, which of course is at the heart of the uh, implement parallel implementation of CA. Each image in this example posts an event to all its 26 neighbors. Um, so you have to know that we use the same Moore's neighborhood for images within a 3D grid as for cells within a 3D CA itself. At the same time, each image waits here for 26 um, events, 26 events, which will come from its 26 neighbors. And when this counter reaches 26, the image which executes this call knows that all 26 neighbors posted their data and it can proceed further. The advantage of events over, say, sync images is that an image does not need to know who posted, only that some images have posted. It just tracks the counter here of 26. And this limits synchronization requirements somewhat to really what is absolutely necessary. Open core arrays already support events, but no other compilers do. So we are tentatively looking for implementing this feature in CGPAC in the near future. Finally, many CGPAC routines have a tight triple nested loop, similar to what's shown here, which scans over all CA cells on an image. Such loops might be parallelized with OpenMP, which would be particularly useful for KNL, 
uh, Intel um, Xeon Phi platforms. However, the major problem is that interaction of OpenMP and Core Arrays is completely undefined at present. So this means that no remote operations, no remote Core Array operations are safe inside an OpenMP loop because the results would be undefined, unpredictable rather. And another possibility would be uh, Fortune 20A do concurrent, which is a special type of a do loop for those who, who are not familiar with this. It's designed for loops in which the order of loop operations is not important. Again, this basically tells the compiler that it's possible, it's safe to parallelize, auto-parallelize. However, to achieve this, there are very severe restrictions on the operations inside the loop to ensure such order independence. In particular, all procedures whole call from the loop must be pure, which is which means basically no side effects. Uh, no I.O. operations, no image control statements, and many, many other restrictions, which is hard to implement at present. And therefore, the conclusion again is that more work is needed to even, even to decide whether this is a uh, possible in principle or not, never mind the performance gain. And by the way, at present, we have uh, in most runs single core, single image approach. So if OpenMP is used, it's not even clear whether advantage will be achieved. Although, of course, on KNL platforms, things are slightly different. So in conclusion, all aims of our ECSC project have been achieved. We have improved portability and performance of the hybrid core MPI multi-scale framework. Uh, we would also recommend Fortune Core Arrays to others particularly for structured grid methods such as CA, but other structured grid methods as well, where implementation of core arrays is very, very natural, natural mapping to a physical problem. Uh, we flag, wanted to flag the need for improved support for core arrays by profiling, tracing, and debugging tools. Uh, we mentioned here briefly that Scorpi and Scalaska also do support core arrays, although in a limited way, I understand only when they are mapped onto MPI calls under the hood at present, at least. Finally, we have to know that more optimization work is needed for our framework to implement a more flexible synchronization level to improve performance. Of course, I would like to acknowledge on behalf of the investigators of the project ECSC for, sorry, Archer for funding embedded uh, computer and computational science and engineering prog program, and also all the non Cray work was done on the, uh, the University of Bristol uh, Blue Crystal system managed by the Advanced Computing Research Center. The remaining pages are just references. Thank you very much for your attention, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Hi, so this is Chris again here from EPCC. So uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, we've got time for a couple of quick ones. Uh, just type into the chat. If not, I'm sure uh, if you get in contact uh, that uh, the speakers will be happy to, to answer your questions uh, by email. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so um, I've it may it may seem a little bit strange having a question from one of the one of the speakers, but uh, I'll I'll go ahead anyway. Um, Anton, do we do we know how large a problem that we can solve and how far? we can go in using more cores because one of the things that I thought might be picked up by the audience is that our aspiration is exascale and we showed for a particular fixed problem that scaling tailed off at about 7,000 cores. But that was that was for a fixed problem. But I'm, I'm not sure whether we've 
we've had a go at keep on increasing the problem size and pushing up the number of cores. Okay, it's a good question, of course. So some problems will scale further. Solidification, um, we stopped at 32,000 because of um, relatively long waiting times in the queue. I'm pretty sure it can scale to maybe 40, perhaps 50,000 cores. It's really a very, very nicely balanced problem. When a fracture happens, this is a much, a much more poorly balanced problem. So I'm not sure if we can achieve really enormous progress without introducing dynamic load balancing. And that would be extremely complicated in the context of this simple mapping of uh, core arrays onto MPI processes. So partition of the, the model. Partition of the model essentially is static for the duration of the analysis. Uh, but at this stage, it's really hard to say exactly what's the next bottleneck. So we reached this 7,000 cores for a particular fracture application. Is this due to inefficiencies in the inner loops, perhaps, in the fracture algorithm itself, or something else? Uh, not completely clear to me. I think we can definitely uh, make useful predictions, useful simulations uh, to probably 20,000 cores, but scaling will be uh, not that great. If that's a capability problem where we require access to a much bigger model space, then this is still feasible. So um, I showed at some point examples of about uh, one terabyte models, we can push this to probably 10 terabytes um, with reasonable performance. We wouldn't get any further speed up, but I believe 15, 20,000 cores is, is doable. But yeah, we just need, need some more work to understand this better. The I.O. of course is another problem uh, when we have to output this significant data sets, we lose a significant amount of time on I.O. And really at this stage, uh, I can see a uh, future where will be the runtime, the total runtime will be dominated by I.O., which is really not ideal. Uh, it, it seems we're really at the cutting edge, even though I say so myself, but we are, uh, I think, at the cutting edge of the HPC developments. It is really relatively new. Even Cray support is still catching up, never mind the other vendors. So perhaps if we just wait and do nothing else, performance will improve by a better IO libraries, perhaps, and things like that. But um, yeah, we'll, um, we'll need to work on it. Clearly. Let me just read the other question. OK, thanks. Okay, so there was a question from Andre uh, Bruckno there, uh, just saying, yes, yeah, so first of all said thank you. You said a question to Anton, could you please comment in more detail on what is the primary benefit of co arrays versus regular arrays, particularly the co arrays truly shared between images? Yes, the quick answer is yes, they are truly shared. Co array really is an object defines on an image to which all other images can have read and write access. That's what a core array is. Core array, by the way, does not have to be an array. It could be an, um, a scalar variable. Core prefix means it's um, shared, essentially. That, that's what it means. So a variable, uh, let me point to this, for example. This variable is defined in the program. At runtime, multiple copies of the executable will be running asynchronously. So every image will have this space array defined, right? And every other image can have read and write access to this space. So image three, for example, can read into space array on image 25 and even, even more complicated uh, features. Image five, for example, 
can issue a call for image seven to send some data to image 30, nothing to do with, with its own data at all. So uh, primary benefit, obviously, yes, it's a truly shared uh, scenario in, um, I think in conventional HPC terminology, I would say the major difference between core arrays and MPI is that in MPI, we usually think about partitioning. We think of a large data set and how it is partitioned over MPI processes. Whereas in core arrays, it's the other way around. The large model is uh, created by logically, only logically thinking of all uh, core, arrays, core array variables and all images put together. So what you see here is, um, is a logical construction. The visualization is purely logical. This, this uh, large model does not exist. What exists instead are smaller core array variables of the smaller cubes on every image. And logically, it, it benefits me to think of those individual 18 uh, arrays as a part of a large model data set. So again, yes, the answer to your question, the simple answer is yes, it is truly shared. Um, I'm not sure, two-point pair correlation function, I'm not sure what that is exactly, but just think of it as a, um, as a data which, which is uh, shared, yes. You have full read and write access to any core array data structures on any other images. So if it helps, in your problem, I presume this is what uh, particle physics. Okay. Well, uh, just to mention, I have been uh, running a core course in Bristol, and there is one run regularly by EPCC at Edinburgh. The Bristol course is now fully open sourced and uh, hosted on SourceForge. If you go to SourceForge and search for core arrays, you'll find the course with lots of examples and and uh, notes and if you try to give it a go now that the GCC supports it as well it's very easy to just to give it a go on a laptop you don't necessarily need access to Archer or, or any other crazy systems for it anymore okay so I think we should probably wrap up now but uh, just to thank the speakers again um, and if you do have any questions, please just either get in touch directly with the speakers or um, if you email via the help desk, we can pass things on. Um, so thank you very much and uh, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>